Hello everyone and welcome back to Realism Overhaul Sandbox in Kerbal Space Program 1.3.1 where I'm continuing my Shuttle Constructed Mars mission where instead of building the International Space Station, the shuttle is being used to build an International Mars mission. These launches all occur during live streams on Twitch and the music is from a shuffle playlist so sometimes it fits great, other times not at all. This is the 11th launch of the sequence, and I have planned 12 launches for the main construction of the IMM, the International Mars Mission, and this time we are bringing up another Xenon tank for it, and then the last mission will bring up the Ion Engine module, and then it'll be fully fit to do a Mars mission technically. It has the food, water, and oxygen, it has the fuel, it has living space. What well, doesn't have right now are Kerbals or a proper return vehicle to bring the Kerbals back down to the surface of the Earth, nor a lander for the surface of Mars. But it could go to Mars and come back. At least I think it can. It depends if my calculations with the Xenon and the Ion engines are correct. So here's another Xenon tank and we've already got a few on the station. The ISP of the ion engines is 3,280 seconds, and I got the stats for them from a NASA paper. Uh, they weigh each 2.25 tons and provide, I think it's about 60 newtons of thrust. So, and then there's three of them that are going to power this. So you're talking about about 180 newtons of thrust altogether. And that's assuming that the solar panels are getting full power. Now, last week I didn't post a video because I was doing ion engine testing. And the key is to make sure that the ion engines can work during time warp. And I managed to do that with KSB Interstellar. And so I have to modify the Lackluster Labs ion engines that I'm using that I configured with the appropriate configuration with the correct stats for the engines. And I had to add the uh, KSB Interstellar module to it so that they work during time warp and we're going to see that during this video here. So without too much fuss we are getting this uh, set of xenon tanks docked with the station. We had to move a tug away from the station in order to free up that docking port. The tug was there from the previous xenon tank. We actually have a lot of little tugs floating around the station and that's gonna be some help to us later on. Right now there are actually four of these little tugs around the station, all hypergolic of course. Uh, this one uses Hydrazine, but the others use MMH and Mon3 because that's the fuel the Orion capsule uses. And I wanted to make sure they share the same fuel, but this was the oldest one using Hydrazine here. So I do have the KSP Interstellar plugin in this install, but not the parts because it comes with like 400 megabytes of parts and those aren't immediately relevant to this mission right now. Though I'd love to use those parts for Mars missions later on and maybe we'll have some fun with that, but Basically, I took the KSP Interstellar mod and then deleted everything in the parts folder. Uh, so that's how it is right now. And fortunately, that works out for us. The good thing about the KSP Interstellar mod's implementation is that it automatically throws down on the dark side when it's time warping. So you don't get pulled out of time warp because the electric charge has diminished or anything like that. So you don't have to worry about that. You can keep the time warp up even when it's uh, not getting electric charge. It'll stop accelerating, you'll stop the apoapsis and periapsis from going up while you're not getting electric charge. So that's excellent. So here what we're doing is realigning this part of the IMM because it wasn't quite lined up properly. I still have the problem with the center solar panels which are askew, but at least I wanted to get this part lined up properly. It's a lot of work though. It's a uh, tough to maneuver something like this. It's not as simple as backing up and then docking to it. I mean, it ought to be, but not when it doesn't have thrusters on its own and the tugs are somewhat off balance. There are three tugs on here right now, so it's a delicate business. And here we go, gently getting it docked to the rest of it. So now we have just one module left to send up, and that will be the actual ion engines. Also, two small FRE1s that uh, use methane and oxygen uh, to provide quicker thrust when necessary. The propulsion section also has RCS ports that are configured to methane and oxygen and in retrospect I probably should have reconsidered that. I thought that the radiators would be able to handle the boil off but we'll soon see that the radiators seem to have an odd problem in here. But besides that 
Uh, it really only gets a little bit more efficiency using methane and oxygen over the Hypergolix MMHM on 3. And if we carry more MMHM on 3, we could um, use that for the Orion, for instance, and refuel that, or also refuel some of our tugs. So it's multi purpose if we use them for that. The downside is that I hadn't configured the Lackluster Labs tanks to use MMHM on 3. I had actually edited them for Realism Overhaul, of course, but the tanks for Lackluster Labs I configured to MH and N204, as well as methane and oxygen, of course, I had multiple options, but MMH and MON3 were not one of the options, and I got lazy and decided not to add MMH and MON3 as an option. So I might need to change them so that they have that as an option. But here we are, uh, coming in for a landing. Things worked out reasonably well as far as the trajectory this time. And I was trying real hard to slow down the landing. But again, we don't have the rudder air brake on this, so it's a little bit difficult. It has a lot of momentum going in. And of course, you only have one chance. And if I can land on a runway, I want to land on a runway, even if it's a little bit fast. So here we are coming in, still a little bit fast. We should be uh, just shy of 100 meters per second, really, if we want to be realistic. So this is still fast and somewhat dodgy. This shuttle you'll notice is Discovery, and previously we had only been using Atlantis because I had trouble with the SSTU plugin. The SSTU plugin for texture switching uh, was altered between 1.2.2 and 1.3.1. Uh, thanks to help from Raider Nick, I was able to get Discovery in. Uh, he really wanted to see Discovery and decided to mess with the plugin for my benefit in order to see Discovery launch. Unfortunately, on this launch, I accidentally forgot to change the wing texture, so it's got Discovery labeled on the side of the cockpit, but it's got Atlantis on the wing. <laughs> so uh, this mission had been put together before the plugin change, so I forgot to make that edit. So yeah, but uh, thankfully we now have texture switching enabled on the shuttle, but it took some work from Raider Nick. Unfortunately, I just didn't understand how to adapt the way texture switching happened with the DECQ shuttle in 1.2.2 to the way it happens with SSTU in 1.3.1. So, I probably should have just figured out how to change how the texture switching happens, but I just couldn't figure that out. Anyway, but uh, hardly the biggest problem that we're going to be having during all of this. Theoretically, the IMM would have been crewed by this time and would have been testing out its systems in Earth orbit before this particular section was added to it. With the propulsion module added to it, it's going to boost up to a lunar orbit, at least I hope so, and during the boost up to lunar orbit it will not have crew on it because otherwise the crew will get severely irradiated, especially while it's passing through the Van Allen belts. So it would have to be uncrewed while it's cycling up to lunar orbit. And then once in orbit around the moon, we would continue operations, resupply it with the xenon. And also with other fuels. In fact, uh, you'll notice we've got a bit of a problem with the liquid oxygen. Remember, the liquid methane and liquid oxygen are for the propulsion unit. The propulsion unit has liquid methane, liquid oxygen, RCS, as well as the FRE1s. But unfortunately, during launch, our, our main engines took that fuel, the liquid oxygen, away from it because it was being drained at the same rate as the external tank. I forgot to lock it. So, at this point, I do not realize that until I release the payload. And once I release the payload, I realize that I'm short of RCS fuel. And so here we've got this problem. And as long as it's got its RCS available to it, this propulsion module can dock itself, of course. But with the liquid oxygen that low, it's not a good situation. These thrusters are fairly powerful because they are actually meant to turn the entire ship. So they guzzle the liquid methane and liquid oxygen pretty fast. I tried to turn, of course, the IMM in order to face the oncoming propulsion unit in order to help it out. Uh, so that I could potentially just coast in. But even that's very difficult with this. Just pointing at the propulsion unit without drifting away from the propulsion unit turned out to be very difficult. So I decided to bring in a tug, of course. I had to remove a tug previously. 
The problem with using a tug to bring it in is the tug has got to be sandwiched between propulsion unit and the rest of the mission. So it's got to be a permanent fixture for a little while, at least until we can replenish the liquid oxygen on this unit. Once we replenish the liquid oxygen, then we can use its own RCS to reposition it, get the tug out of the way, and put it back on. It's not really a breeze though, because it's still a very heavy unit for the tug to be manipulating. And of course the RCS is imbalanced, that goes without saying. Uh, it is also carrying some xenon gas in it, that's why it has substantial delta V on its own. Uh, but that delta V is not really useful for docking procedures. But here we are, lined up, and the tug is gonna get sandwiched, so it's gonna be... It's gonna be there, but then again, we're gonna be carrying all our tugs along with us to the moon, and you'll see why. You'll see why. So here's our International Mars mission in all of its glory after 12 shuttle missions to construct it. And it is basically ready to go, except if you notice, it's trying to turn to prograde right now, and even with the tugs using the RCS to try and push it, this is its best turn rate. You can actually see sort of the RCS plumes of one of the tugs trying to push it to rotate it, and this is the best rate it can turn. So it's gonna be tough to get this just to point in the right direction to do any of the burns. But we've lit our ion engines in the back. You can see the acceleration provided though. It's a little bit lower than it should be because the solar panels aren't all getting electric charge. Uh, you can see that the apoapsis and periapsis are not exactly lifting up and that was because our RCS thrusters were still turning us and actually pushing us down a bit. But now it's all situated properly and we're getting the full 1.2 I think millimeters per second squared of acceleration. So yes, we need time warp. During time warp the current acceleration goes to zero but you'll notice the apoapsis and periapsis still going up. And I decide, as the initial boost, to put it into a 500 by 500 ish orbit. We couldn't go any higher than that because we still need to bring the shuttle back down. And it's gonna take weeks to cycle this up to moon orbit anyway. You'll notice that we have more than 11,000 meters per second, and sort of keep track of that. Uh, and you can check out our vessel mass, and you'll be able to compare it. We will get to lunar orbit, I promise and uh, you'll be able to see the vessel mass there and see how much mass was burned in doing the transfer. But for now we're going to leave this be in orbit around the Earth. It's somewhat harder to get to with the shuttle now and actually after this we are not going to be using the shuttle to directly rendezvous with it. We will be sending it off to the moon and the shuttle will just have to launch something with a centaur stage in order to get that to the mission. Any payload to the mission will have to have a full transfer to the moon available to it. So here we are, descending again through the atmosphere. Um, we've done this before. The shuttle is not carrying any down mass, so I'm not expecting any problems as far as trajectory is concerned. I expect it to perform exactly the same as it did last time. And indeed, for the most part, it does. I still have to work on how its trajectory is when we do have some down mass, that seems to be a problem. Here I decided that you might enjoy some of those ship manifests interesting sound effect as I dump the hypergolic fuels ahead of approach to KSC. Oh, the problem is when I need to transition from KOS to my own control, uh, that gets a little bit dodgy, so there I transitioned and it sort of rolled a little bit more than it ought to. This time though, it seemed like uh, the timing was such that I was approaching from the opposite side of the shuttle landing facility. I went with that, though it took a little bit of wiggling to dump the speed, so I'm doing mini S turns here to try and just dump speed ahead of landing. That's the only way I can slow down without the air brakes. But here we are, touching down faster than the last time. Bit rough. So our main sequence of missions is done, that's the main construction of it, though we still have to send up the Orion return vehicle as well as the lander. But uh, for now we can actually test the International Mars mission on an uncrewed test run to Mars and try and get it out there and bring it back. But first I wanted to send it over to the moon so that we could refuel it with uh, xenon gas. Uh, interestingly just right there you saw the xenon gas all disappeared. Uh, it was nearly full, and then it went to like 30% and then zero immediately. 
Of course, it was not consuming it, so that's a bug. Uh, fortunately, I am recording the video. I was reminded later that I can just check the video to see the quantity of xenon gas in there to replenish it by editing the persistent file, which is what I'll do if that ever happens again. So, and it does. <laughs> it happens one more time. Thankfully, it's not too constant. Then we had another bug, and that occurs right about there. Interesting that the sound effect was like way off from where the actual location of the part is, but yeah, we had a radiator blow up for no apparent reason at 24,000 Kelvin, and so there goes the whole containing boil off part of what I was trying to do there. And there's the wiping out of xenon gas again. So at this point I was a little bit worried. Both of our radiators blew up. We, we had already put radiators on one of the solar trusses and those had blown up. So we've been having a lot of trouble with radiators in this particular install. I'm gonna have to figure that out, but for now we're gonna run without radiators and I'm keeping a close eye on the KSP Interstellar dialogues as we cycle out. Note that even though we start out in a mostly circular orbit, our apoapsis and periapsis are now lopsided, and that is because it is not providing uh, thrust during the nighttime side. Of course, once we get all the way out here, it's a little bit uh, more balanced. You get uh, very little shadowing from the Earth. And at that point, I decided to plot for the moon. Now, in my infinite wisdom, I decided not to put this into the same inclination as the moon. That would make it too easy. So it's an off-plane transfer, and on our first flyby of the moon, we're trying to get the moon's help with all of this. On our first flyby, we're going to try and get it to flatten out our inclination, and then we'll continue doing flybys to try and get its help. After all, we're not going to be able to get the Oberth effect of it and do the burn very close to periapsis. Any burn that we're going to do to try and catch her on the moon is going to take a substantial amount of time and be very inefficient altogether. Remember, we started out with 11,000 meters per second, you can see what we have now. In general, it seems like the amount of delta V that an ion engine needs to do anything is about double what anything else would need. And that's because it's constantly circularizing itself. It's cycling out instead of doing like a, a very highly elliptical orbit. Every transfer is like circular. So it's constantly circularizing and using basically double the fuel. Uh, well, not double the fuel, double the delta V. Uh, as far as the actual propellant it is concerned, it's still more efficient than anything else. Uh, because, again, it's got 3,280 seconds of ISP. Even if you cut that in half, that's 1,600. It is a bit heavy. Uh, the total engine mass is 6.75 tons here. And then you have to add in the solar panels and everything. But still, it's pretty darn good on balance. As you can see, we're on our flyby of the moon here. And the total vessel mass of this is still huge. And the amount of propellant load is basically, I want to say one third of the total mass, maybe between one quarter and one third of the total mass. A normal transfer out to the moon and capture would take twice the dry mass of the vehicle. So there you go. And of course, having the lower propellant mass means that we needed fewer shuttle missions to launch this and actually the use of a shuttle to construct this kind of mission would be difficult if we had to use cryogenic fuels. Alright, so here I've got an optimistic plot of 43 meters per second to try and capture but I started it too late and since I started it too late I just couldn't get it done. So we had to pass by again after a correction of 3 meters per second. And of course, 3 meters per second still takes like an hour. So, and it also takes a whole lot of turning. Uh, this does not do very well. But we manage it. And so here we are on yet another approach of the moon. And we have already started burning. We are already uh, doing a retro burn here. Already 16,000 kilometers away from the lunar surface. And we just keep retro burning all the way in. That's how long it takes. We're not that far away from lunar orbit, mind you. I mean, it's only like in the double digits in Delta V as far as how much we needed to do, but we just take a lot of time with the ion engines to do it. So we're still burning on the way out here, and I'm wondering whether we can actually capture on this pass or whether we're gonna have to go around again. 
This was very instructive though, and it'll help me to figure out exactly what to do around Mars. This is essential practice for me. We did manage to capture there, though I ended up with a negative periapsis, you'll notice, so I had to head out to Apoapsis to boost it up. Uh, but that was better than having to head out into Earth space again and potentially be in an escape situation. Just because you're close to lunar orbit doesn't mean that it hasn't accidentally flung you in some very horrible direction because uh, the difference between lunar orbit and escape is about 100 meters per second. So as I pull down our apoapsis around the moon to make it a safer orbit, we are in orbit around the moon. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like and I'll see you next time.